Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to this, what I'm sure will be a fascinating webinar tonight, a live webinar on migrating birds and how to turn them from a nuisance to a resource for farmers in the Arava, the Southern Negev Desert. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Shofit of the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. With us is uh, Avi Sadiv, the Executive Director of Canadian Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel, our affiliate Toronto-based. And um, Noam's, Noam Weiss will be with us tonight. He's, Wife, I believe, is um, Jessica is on. Uh, is on. No one is. No one's getting on. Just to. We're still a couple minutes from starting. We'll let everybody join. People are still joining. It. A nice clip, uh, from all over the world. I'm assuming. So please, you can in the chat let us know where you're from. It's always a nice idea. Thank you for starting us off, Joy and John from Hyde Park, Chicago. I grew up near Hyde Park, New York, home of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, I'll take the opportunity to thank our, uh, our board members and our donors and our supporters and all of you from, from all over the globe, um, all the continents we often have on these webinars. Everybody's, uh, we appreciate so much everybody's support and interest in our work and, uh, especially sending a shout out to our Europeans. I don't know who's going to be on tonight or some parts of Eastern Europe, what the internet situation is even. It's uh, black days. Uh, Jay, the Q&A. Excuse me? Questions to be posted, please, in the Q&A Q oh, section. You heard Avi, everybody. Please put, post the questions in the Q&A section and not in the chat, if you can, please. <clears throat> Helps us keep, um, keep track of them better. Uh, no one will speak for a while and then we'll get to some questions and answers at the end. And if we don't get to your questions and answers, uh, feel free to contact us. You know how um, the same emails that you signed up for or on our Facebook if you don't have our email yet. And, um, and uh, we will try to get your questions answered if they are, if you let us know. So thanks everybody much. Uh, Two minutes after the hour here, uh, I haven't turned on the news in a while and don't know what's going on, but uh, Israel feels very close to the situation going on now in, uh, in Eastern Europe. <clears throat> there are um, hundreds of thousands of uh, Israeli citizens of Ukrainian descent here and millions of Russian descent. I was at a march last night in Tel Aviv with maybe close to 10,000, felt like mostly Ukrainians. Um, but a lot of Israelis and a lot of Russians who are um, both the Russian people in general we see from polls and the Russians here seem to be um, pretty distrusting of Putin and what's going on. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if there's any angle tonight uh, other than we did get a um, an email today um, from a Russian uh, purporting to be from a, um, a uh, Ukrainian uh, NGO asking us to stop the invasion because of the ecological damage of Russia's use of fossil fuels and its expansion of fossil fuels and what this will mean for, um, for that. So there's an angle, everything is, everything is being affected people. But we're gonna concentrate on something a little more upbeat and, and, and frankly uh, interesting and frankly crucial as well to the future of the globe. And that is protecting biodiversity and protecting habitats. Um, here in our little part of the Middle East, which is a very, very special part of the world, uh, part of the 2.9% of the globe that the UN has declared a global biodiversity hotspot. hotspot. I'm sure many of you know, we have, uh, we have a great um, number of species of flora and fauna per, per square kilometer here and many different habitats. Uh, one of them, some of you may be a little less familiar with is the Aravat Desert, but that's where um, we're gonna be focusing on tonight. Uh, Noam and Jessica. Uh, Hi everyone. In, I their, uh, in their in their apartment down in the RFI, I forget which yeshuv, um, but uh, Noam is the director of the uh, Elad Birding Center, the birding uh, research center, um, right on the Jordanian border, uh, 
a few kilometers uh, north of the city of Eilat. A must, a must, a must place to visit if you're if you're in Israel, and certainly if you're uh, and if you're in the south, if you're in a lot, it's really, really a special place, uh, and it's changing all the time. And uh, Noam and his um, his um, partner Jessica, a researcher down there, will be hearing, I think, from both of them tonight uh, about some really fascinating research. I think we're getting ready to go. We're up close to 100 participants here now, and probably some more on Facebook. Yeah, we're live on Facebook as well. So um, we'll take it away. I know Noam has a lot to talk about. He's a uh, charming guy, a great guy down there in uh, the director for several years now of the Birding Center in a lot. And um, he's going to take us away with, I think, a very, very interesting and important story. So thank you very much, Noam and Jessica. Thank you, Jay. And uh, thank you for the introduction. So Jessica is my wife, but she's also the head of the research about how birds can help farmers. So Jessica works Maybe you present yourself. I'm working, I'm working down here in the uh, um, Agricultural Research and Development Center uh, in the uh, Southern Arava. And I'm also the academic director of the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies. So it's a really, really small area here. We are just uh, 5,000 inhabitants in Southern Arava. We live in Berowa. And uh, let's get, get on with it, okay? So uh, I'll, I'm, as, as Jay said, from the International Building and Research Center of Elat. And our topic today is gonna be uh, how can we help birds migrate to Southern Arava? That's my part. And Jessica's part is how can migratory birds help farmers with pest control uh, in their fields? It all started from a field in Yotvata, which is a very, very important stop oversight for birds from fields uh, that is becoming a solar panel uh, in, a st uh, infrastructure. And uh, actually, uh, we were uh, we were uh, thinking how we can uh, find a substitute for these birds. At first, we thought that maybe we are going to lease a field and uh, grow our own crops for the birds. Then we realized it's not really working. Nobody really wants to give a field, so we changed the approach to a research approach that we are going to present to you uh, today. So migratory birds as biological pest control in uh, agents in fields and, south, uh, uh, and orchards in Southern Arava. Yes, thank you. So, can you see this? I, I think it, the, uh, the second, I need a second here. Okay, so fields. What are fields ecologically? If you look at them, they are an extremely manufactured habitat. It's very, very different from the natural habitat that birds usually use. Think of the soil, it's tempered with chemicals, it's plowed, sterilized, and fertilized. The water, here in the desert especially, it's heavily irrigated. Our, our uh, annual rainfall is 20 millimeters and a field here can get up to a thousand or even more millimeters to grow stuff, so it's very different. The flora, monoculture or sprayed. Insects, some are pests, therefore heavy use of pesticides that actually kill everything. Disturbances are many, light, noise, infrastructure, pop, people, dogs, and even donkeys that eat the, eat the herbs. Uh, agricultural waste everywhere, everything that looks like a part of nature could, this, could be suspected as pests. So we are talking about a very, very unusual habitat from the point of view of the bird very far from nature. Nevertheless, the birds vote with their wings. They come. Why do they come? Abundance of food in a very crucial point of their journey from right now, we are experiencing spring migration. Uh, cranes and storks and step eagles are passing every day. So they need a place to stop, rest and have some food. There is plenty of water. There is plenty of shelter, perches, high places. The other habitats that they used to use are dry or damaged, and the farmers actually could use some help. So agricultural uh, landscape can be very different, as you can see in the slide, and also the biodiversity is affected from that. It depends on the structure and richness of the agricultural habitat, and also the surrounding of the field. Uh, the and the level of the biodiversity usually indicates how many different services nature can provide 
not only to nature itself, but also to the field as kind of part of nature. Abundancy indicates that uh, what would be the power, the quantity of these services. Lots of birds from large diversity means, means lots of services. So we are in this uh, uh, rural uh, uh, um, uh, urban gradient in the rural area where the use, you have some population, you have some plants and fauna, bi biodiversity is pretty high, some pollution, water runoff and flood regulation is pretty good, uh, etc. So we are not in an, a nature area and we are not in an urban area, we are somewhere in between. Why birds are so important uh, uh, for any kind of research like this or any kind of ecosystem actually? Birds are important because they are large, because there are many of them, because they are diverse. Most importantly, they are mobile. They move from place to place easily. There is a pest here, they eat it here. There is a pest there, they move there and do it there. They, they live in every possible habitat and they even move between habitats and even between continents. Think of one bird and how many, uh, how many uh, uh, services it can give in different times and places along the year. This co beautiful colored flycatcher photographed in the bird sanctuary of Elat, during breeding time, they need proteins to feed their youngs. Pest control, proteins come from insects. When they prepare for migration, they move to fruits and nectar, and they do pollination, seeding, and cleanup of the environment. On migration, they change their location, they move to stop oversights, change also to other habitats, change of, the, of uh, food. They eat whatever is available. And what they do, the services they can give during migration is very long range pollination. They take pollen over hundreds, sometimes thousands of kilometers. It's genetic material that helps nature uh, cope with changes. It does pest control, cleanup, seeding. And most importantly, during migration, birds are super active. They do more services in less time. They just eat nonstop. In winter time, molting needs, again, pest control. They need the insects. So the needs of the birds change along the year. The habitat changes, the location changes, the level of activity changes. And we are talking about a single bird out of 500 million birds that actually use the Eilat flyway. So resources are seasonal. Ecologic system uh, 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 system services also seasonal and move from place to place. So this is a, this is our flyway. The birds are pushed into the only land bridge, a bottleneck, which is connecting three continents: Europe, Asia, and Africa. A small bird that needs to arrive to Africa without crossing the sea, as it is not so safe, they need to pass through us. The large birds that need thermals must pass over land through us. It's not only the birds that move, but it's the services that they bring with them. All kinds of services. Above our skies, we have pollinators, pest controllers, cleanuppers. All the birds give some kind of service somewhere in the world. And above a lot, they are on the way to another happy customer. In the past, natural habitats were the place they stopped, they did the stop over. This is a lot from 1918. And you can see the salt marsh of Elat, which was an amazing forest in the middle of the desert that provided food for the plants, for the birds. But drainage canals took the water away from the salt marsh and it was destroyed. And also this used to be a natural habitat. You will never guess what it was. It was just a, a, a vadi, a river area without water but it became a quarry. Do you see this tree on the top? It's a protected tree. Ridiculously, it was left there because it's protected. The, just the tractors took the soil, the gravel around it, and now it became a leisure place after floods for the people of Elat. But nature, it is not. So what do the birds do? They use manufactured habitats. Take their, uh, they find a new place. This is are the flamingo pools and the flamingos. It's a salt factory. This is the same site as a stopover site for storks. 
Just yesterday, we saw a flock of a few hundreds of storks passing there. Uh, these are the sewage ponds of Elat, where we re use our recycled water. This, this sewage pond is the most disgusting place you can imagine in the South and Negev near Elat. It's a sewage pond of army, an army base, and birds see it as a great stop of a site. And even local birds, the sand grouse, come to drink in this terrible place. Uh, up to 3,000 sand grouse come to drink here every morning. Uh, also, agricultural habitats also take the place of the natural habitats that are gone. These are date plantations. That's a buzzard in the date plantation, a yellow wagtail in the field, and of course, fish ponds. Fish ponds attract so many water birds that used to feed in the Hula Valley or in other lakes that used to be natural, but are just gone. So birds, are they good to, 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 to a farmer? Should, they, should he promote getting having them or should he just uh, try to get rid of them? So it's, birds can truly be, a, truly, truly be pests. You can see these pelicans feeding on fish that the farmer grows to sell. This is a bee eater eating a bee that is uh, um, supposed to pollinate crops instead of being eaten, a sparrow that eats fruits, etc. So yes, birds can be trouble. And there are many solutions that the, the farmers use, like noise, uh, noise that deter them, uh, decoys, uh, explosions, perches, pro, uh, stopping birds from landing, poisoning them, uh, scarecrows, even netting of the whole habitat, everything to get rid of the presence of birds. Here we have an example, the bee eaters, they sit on the beehives. These beehives pollinate this melon field over here without the pollination, no fruits whatsoever. But the bee eaters during migration arrive and they feed on the bees and the bees stay inside the beehive. So we are, uh, one of our, you can see that the farmer puts some kind of kite that uh, resembles a harrier, which is the predator of the bee eater. It's not very helpful. And uh, we try to mitigate this problem by putting, checking uh, where is the damage done in which beehives. This is an, a field and these are beehives. And you can see that almost all the damage is done along power lines and high trees, meaning this is where the birds like to, to nest, uh, to breed, so, uh, to, to, to perch before they eat. While the only beehive here is without damage because the birds are not comfortable there. So the solution is just to move it. This is Jessica's uh, uh, PhD work about the parakeets and the sunflower seeds that they eat. And we also here, you can see this is the map of the field and the map of the damage done to the field. The green area is zero damage and all the damage is done along perches, along trees and power lines that the bird can use and eat safely. So. If this field, sunflower seed, would be here on the south and a cotton field would be here instead, there'll be no, no damage whatsoever. So we are trying to mitigate and teach farmers to use research approach that look at the needs of the birds and see how they can actually uh, 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 cultivate without having conflicts. But services are probably more significant than these services. This wobbler is pollinating. This blackbird is pest controlling. This, this uh, uh, l crested lark is dispersing seeds. And this uh, 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 starling here is cleaning up, let's say fruits and other stuff that might be the place of the pest of next years. So pest control with wild birds is nothing new. Uh, the first paper that uh, uh, the, the most important uh, uh, early paper was published in 2007, talks about the great tits in apple orchards. And they found out that with nest boxes for great tits in the orchard, they can reduce the damage uh, from caterpillars and uh, actually uh, move the, 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 the orchard from losing money to profit. Uh, it's pretty easy. Just put wooden boxes, the tits will come and will eat. The, the pests. Another important work, 2013, of, of Bea Maas uh, from Austria, and she did the manipulations to cacao 
plantations in Indonesia. And she showed that more than 30% of the crop is because birds and bats are active in the plantation. Once she put a net on top of a cacao tree, preventing birds and, and, and bats from entering the tree, but letting the insects go freely, the, the, the yield went down by more than 30%. So actually the birds are responsible for the profit and if the profit of the farmer and even more. So inviting more birds and bats can actually be very, very useful. Our local example is the barn owl. As a pest control agent, we all, probably all of you have heard about this. Uh, we put nest boxes and they eat our rodents in the fields. And it's very, very uh, 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 successful uh, project. So uh, this is uh, Jessica's and my uh, project of how can migratory birds uh, uh, serve as pest controllers in the fields. Again, I repeat, the Southern Arava is, one, is on one of the world's busiest mig migration routes for birds. They stop over in agricultural habitats. We, we see it from so many years, it's a fact. Along with extensive agricultural use, this is a promising combination for services provided by birds. Why did I go into this project? Why did the Society for Protection of Nature in Israel would go into such a research project as we are not researchers, we are here for nature conservation. So you can see this slide. This is our master plan for stopover sites. Over the years, we map where birds land, where migratory birds stop over, look for food, shelter, rest, and continue. We have marked the most important sites where birds stop. And we work one after the other. We made, we made a master plan. In the flamingo pools, we make sure there are no disturbance. In the sewage ponds, we make sure they have purchased, all their hazards are taken away, etc. Every, every place you see on this map is getting a full care. And today we are just focusing on what we are doing in the fields and orchards. This is just a small part of what are, we are doing to conserve our flyway. Why is the most uh, uh, in the research? I need to say why. Yes. <laughs> so um, the Agricultural Research and Development Center, we call it MOT down here. That's my place of work. And I'm actually a researcher, so I'm actually interested in research. Um, and we want to give new solutions to farmers. So our research is all applied. Um, the problems are brought to us by the farmers and the farmers uh, ask us for help with new solutions um, against specific problems. And uh, pest and pest control is one of the one of the main problems and one of the main issues. Um, and sometimes uh, pesticides that just don't work, they can't be used. Or we have organic uh, growers and they don't want to use, use pesticides. So we are looking for alternative for um, sustainable agriculture for a more sustainable future. So that's why we are in the picture. Yes. So what we were trying to do together is to enhance potential services uh, of birds provided to agriculture and improve their pest control abilities and also to get better and safer stop, stop oversights for migratory birds. So insects such as drips, it's a small insect that loves to eat the onion from the inside. Whitefly and aphids are serious pests in desert farming. Conventional pest control methods are limited, cost intensive and harmful to people and environment. And many migratory and sedentary bird species are potential service agents. So this is our method. Uh, we examine the birds in the field, field and surrounding the whole area and also the birds that fly over. And I'm gonna warn you, I'm gonna show some scientific slides. I'll pass fast uh, on them, just, I just wanted to get the idea. We spread this, this, this is our method in different uh, crops, melon, onions, and we also work with pumpkins. This is our team in the field, uh, volunteers and uh, me examining uh, birds and pests at the same time. Our statistician Noah from the, uh, our uh, research and development agricultural. And this is uh, our fun looking at, at the melons grow. And you can see here on the left that in the field, 74% plus 10% are, 
are insectivore and omnivore birds, which means 84% of the birds are in the field for one thing, eating insects. Which insects? Obviously, the most common insects in the fields are the pests. If you look at the, the whole area, field plus surrounding, you can see that the insectivore birds are just 40%. And the flyover birds, the insectivore birds, are just 33%, which means that the habitat of the field is attracting ins insect eating birds, the birds we want to attract, but they, we don't need to attract them because they are already there. They see the field as a stop of a site and they are active in the field. Who are these birds? Well, it's mainly Antus and Motacilla, which means pipits and wagtails, while outside the field, the dove is more uh, common. Uh, this is interesting to, it was interesting to find that in the, 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 the diversity of birds is very different from one crop to the other. In the melon fields, it's the white wagtail and blue throat working on the white fly, which is the main pest in melons uh, from below the, the, the leaves, while the sand martin and the barn swallow, both are, both are swallow species, are working on the uh, white fly that flies above the crop. If you look at the pumpkin, it's very similar crop to the melon, only that it is higher. And the white fly usually doesn't fly above it because the, the whole habitat is a bit higher. And you can see that the birds that use it are the blue throat, red throated pipit and water pipit. They'd like to, to work under the, co uh, the leaf cover. And in the onions, which is an open habitat, you, you again see the red throated pipit, yellow wagtail, white wagtail. All these birds are step birds that work on the edge or inside uh, the crop. So every crop is a totally different habitat, therefore has totally different bird diversity. Are the birds migratory or local? Well, the answer is very easy. Inside the field, inside the field they are migratory. Outside the field, it's a mixture with more sedentary birds. This is an important graph, which is, this is the timeline of the auto migration. And you can see the different species, the most common species that feed on ins insects when they are present. So if the farmer wants to have a barn swallow, well, tough luck, it lives in the middle of October. And if he wants a chief chaff to eat aphids from below the leaves, well, they only arrive in the end of October. So they need to be, every farmer that wants to use pest control by birds needs to be, to know a little bit, to understand the birds, to understand the habitat of the field and to make some kind of match of how to use these birds in the field as they have different time of arrival and living, what we call researchers phenology. Uh, we can look deeper into some data. At uh, this table, don't have to look too, too much. I'll summarize it. The red-throated pipits are present in all three crops, melon, pumpkin, and onion, but more frequently in onion fields. And while white wagtail, blue throats, barn swallows, and sand martins, they like the melons more than any other crop. So these are just clues for a, a further research to understand uh, how we can use birds more efficiently in pest control. But probably one of my most important findings was that the trips, the trips is a tiny insect that lives inside the leaves of the onion, uh, is uh, when the abundance of the trips rises, the abundance of birds, and especially the red-throated pipit is also rising, which means this is a potential a pest controller, and we have seen them actually eating trips. So when you have trips, they come. When the trips are gone, also the pipits are gone. So here you have an efficient uh, uh, pest controller in the fields that, that we managed to find out with this research. The same with the swallows. This was just a one-time event, but when you see that there are lots of flies in the melons, also the swallows arrive and to feed on them. Makes, makes sense for every bird watcher. But when a farmer looks at its field, it just doesn't see the birds. It doesn't realize 
what the birds are doing there. And only when you open their eyes, they can see, wow, I have flies and I have swallows, they eat them and they give me service. So this is how the fields look like. From above, the swallows, the San Martin, the red rump swallow and the barn swallow, they work intensively. If you have white flies flying above the crop, you can be sure that this, these guys will arrive. During migration, we can have tens of thousands of swallows around and they just look where the flies are. They are ready for their mission. Below the crop, you can see the savvy swabbler and the blue throat are working under the vegetation, catching all the insects that are hiding between the leaves. The chief chaff is picking, is going in and out, in and out all the time, trying to find insects like a patrol against insects, same with water pipit, and ar around the field, you have the yellow wagtail, the white wagtail, and the red-throated pipit that look for any insect that will go uh, uh, between the, the plants. And on the watch guard, the, the watch point, sits the, um, the stone chat looking for movement under him, uh, under it uh, uh, on the ground. Uh, any insect that will move, he's ready to catch. So you can see here, this is the bird squad of the field, the onion fields, they are ready for any pest. And if you have a lot of them, you have services and you don't need pest control, you have it. And um, so one, one in interesting thing that one of the farmers told me is, Noam, if your birds did their job, I wouldn't have to spray at all, right? But I do spray, why? Aren't they efficient enough? So we, we are, our job, Jessica and me, is, and my job, is actually to find ways how to enhance the service, how to bring more birds and keep them in the birds for longer times. And uh, so the service is stronger than what exists naturally. So we looked into variables of habitat structure. Maybe the purchase would help, maybe water availability, maybe shelter, edges of cent or center of field. I must say we didn't find anything significantly, significantly uh, 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 correlated, probably because if there is food in the field, the birds are there. And if there isn't food, they're just not there, whatever the habitat is, but we still work on this. And I'm pretty sure that we will find some features that uh, help us bring birds uh, through habitat structure. To summarize, the fields attract insective or migratory birds. We have high potential for, uh, for biopest control. Each crop attracts different community of birds. The farmer must know what is relevant. Specific bird species are correlated to specific pest species. Pest control can be optimized in relevant bird species if relevant sp bird species are attracted to the crop. What's next in this research? Who eats who? How are we sure that the insective or birds actually eats insects and nothing else? So we are trapping a targeted, a target birds correlated to pests or logically a potential pest, and we do metabarcoding. We check their feces through DNA analysis, and this way we can say exactly what the birds ate. And we can prove for sure if they eat pests or anything else. So this we did last year and this is still under analysis. What else can we do? Another thing we can do is a, another thing that many, that is known from hunters. When hunters want to catch, a, to shoot a bird, they put a, a tape, they, they made, they put a, 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 the, the, the call of the bird to attract the bird to them and shoot it. This is for me disgusting. Uh, also, researchers do that when they need to trap birds from a specific species. They put the tape and the birds come. What if we could use it also for pest control? But we'll have to make a fair deal for the birds and for the farmers. I'll explain a bit later, but this is probably possible. This is what at the moment we are studying. Two interns from Germany, Colin and Antonia, are on it as we speak. Uh, another thing we will do is tag birds and check their movement. How long do they stay in the field? How long do, do they forage? 
movement, movement from one crop to uh, from one crop to the other, from field to field. We, if we tag the birds and watch the movement, we will have answers for that. The problem it is it is costly, so we will only do it after we have enough so, uh, supportive data that proves the efficiency of birds as pest controllers. But this is on the way. And another thing we do is go tell the farmers. So we, we chose to go to the community, uh, to their communities and work with the kids and their parents with a project called the Generous Garden. We, uh, we call it the Generous Garden. We can't live without nature. And we show them uh, ecological system services in action next to our, uh, next to our homes. And we have built together a, a nest bo a, a roost boxes for insectivore birds. We made the insect hotel, uh, bird boxes, bird feeders, and all these kinds of things that might uh, support ecological system services next to their home. It was a very successful place. A project we passed in all the settlements, the agricultural settlements in our region. What about the plantations, the day plantations? So everybody knows if you go and see birds in the plantations, there are so many of them everywhere. What do they eat? What do they do there? So that's easy to answer because we see that the step buzzards, and in a good day in Samar plantation, you can see 1,000 step buzzards sitting on the trees. We, we, saw, we saw them eating the rhinoceros uh, beetles that are a serious pest. The Balkan warblers, they feed on the lesser date moss. It's a pest without pesticide. They don't know how to get rid of it. Other migratory birds like black caps and lesser white throat, they feed on the rest of the moss caterpillars or adults. So we see them feeding on known pests all the time. So who are the birds who live in the plantations? 91% of them are just seven species, mixture of migratory and local birds. The, the color of the, of the name of, of the species uh, indicates what service it gives. So the most common bird in the plantations was the lesser white throat. 925, and he's a pest controller. The next two are sedentary, house bear and white, and white spectacle bulbul. They do pest control and cleanup. When I say cleanup, what does it mean? It means they eat the dates that fell on the ground, and this is actually the habitat for the pest of next years. So it's also a kind of pest control. So these are the most common birds that are cool there. Two of them are migratory and pest controllers. We compared non-organic conventional uh, uh, plantations to uh, organic plantations. In Eliphaz, you see it's a conventional plantation without ground vegetation. It's sterile, just palm trees, nothing else. And you can see in this, in this uh, uh, table on the top one, bird activity of pest control givers, just 205 birds were observed in Eliphaz. Well, in Samar, we saw seven times more because it's organic and it has ground vegetation that looks like that. Okay, a lot of vegetation means a lot of birds in the plantation, but does it actually help us? Do the birds in these bushes help the farmer? Do they eat pests or do they eat just insects that live in bushes? So the answer is right here. If we, um, First of all, many of the pests go also to the bushes. So every, every insect which is eaten in the plantation is uh, uh, it's good for the farmer. But let's assume that, that the lesser date moss, especially, they live in the canopy. So in Eliphaz, 7.3 birds on average are seen in the canopy. And it is the place where most birds are seen because there is no other place which is green. It's the only habitat actually. So birds uh, use the canopy because they have no other choice. In Otsmada, when they do have a choice, when there are lots of trees around, most of the birds are on the detached vegetation, which means on the trees which are next to the palm trees. But the number of birds in, in the, on the canopy is better than in Eliphaz. The service is better. What about Samar? the organic plantation with a lot of vegetation on the ground, 
So most of the birds, yes, they are not on the tree, they are on the vegetation, which is next to the tree. But look on the, what's happening in the canopy. These birds move from the bushes near the trees to the canopy and back. Bushes, canopy, bushes, canopy, and this is how it works. You give the birds good habitat, good vegetation on the ground, and you get effective pest control in the canopy and in other places too in the plantation. You can see that the grand total of, uh, of birds in Elifaz and Neots Madar and in Samar, the organic plantations is much higher than in the conventional one. So this is how it looks in Elifaz, the conventional uh, uh, plantation. Uh, the Balkan warbler, it feeds on the, on the lesser date moss in the canopy. They only use canopy anyway. They don't like the bushes. Some bulbuls work there too. The buzzards sit on the top and eat the, the, the beetles on the ground. And if you have pests, so you have some tools helping the farmers to overcome the pest problem, but not like in Samar. You go to Samar to the organic plantation and look what's happening. It's full of birds, diversity and abundance. And it seems like every pest that will ever arrive there, there will be some kind of solution. Uh, if a pest likes to be in the trunk, well, the chief chaff likes to work on the trunk. If the, the, the pest moves from the canopy to the bushes, well, the warblers and the robin, they wait in the bushes and run after the pest sometimes to the canopy. When you have more, di bigger diversity of birds and a larger abundance of them, so the solution, the, 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 the tools, the, the kit that, that the farmer has the biological kit of how to overcome pests is much larger. It has options. Therefore, it is more efficient. And this is how it looks there. It's full of birds. Just arrived there from there today. It was so full of birds. And if you want to make a party, what do you need? Music and a pool, right? So this is our what we do. Uh, this, uh, what, this is what we do in this season of research. We are putting calls, tapering to attract more of the migratory birds, never the sedentary birds, and put a pool for water to see if it attracts even more birds. The more birds we attract, the higher the services are. But is it a fair deal? Is it fine to, to bring a bird on its migration instead of continuing to the breeding ground to stop the plantation and eat? Well, the answer is we must make a deal. And the key deal is called integrated pest management. It's first for the birds, because if there are pests, the farmer gives, it, gives the birds a chance. He puts the tape luring, he puts the water pools, and the birds work. It's also so, and so we are, he's taking measures to bring more birds because there is more food and there is no pesticide. There is no chemical use of, of pesticides. It is also fair for the, for the farmer, because if the birds can't do their job, right, and they still have pests, well, then they can close the tape, the tape luring, they can shut the, the, the water pools and use chemicals that, like they always did. This is called IPM, Integrated Pest Management, and this is the deal we make with the farmers. So how to, how to make the birds do their job better? Make the habitat better take risks away, make flowering strips, make the habitat great. So the birds will feel at home and come. What is a friendly field habitat? Healthy and nutritious, lots of food for long periods, diverse food, free of pesticides, safe, free of all kinds of hazards, logical abundance of predators like cats, available shelter from predators, free of disturbances, supportive habitat structure like purchase diverse habitat structure, etc., and some water. And uh, I was going to present also a work about uh, bats. I see that my time is finishing slowly, so I'll just go fast. Uh, if birds work during the day, what about the night active insects? Actually, the moss is mostly active at night. This is why Jessica is doing the the, the bat research. 
if the first year we checked what species are around, uh, we, uh, Jessica found 13 species foraging in the day plantation, foraging activity was high, and Evie that did his, her uh, PhD examined the feces and checked what actually do they eat? Do they actually serve as pest controllers? This is the lesser date moss. This guy, no pesticide, it's a okay. big one. Uh, no. it has a now it has a pesticide, okay, not updated. Uh, and we found three different species of bats that come in huge numbers to feed on it. We found their uh, remains in their feces. The sub beetles, four species of bats. And the rhinoceros beetle, one interesting bat that is actually a uh, uh, feeding on mainly sometimes on a, a scorpions. It is a, it's the desert long eared bat which is crawling on the ground and eating large insects. It's a very interesting one. And Yuval, uh, Yuval uh, uh, examined together with Jessica uh, what if we, how do we attract uh, these bats into the plantation? And they used the water pools. Uh, insectivore bats need to drink, but the what they need to drink in a very special way, in flight. So this is why they need large pools without obstacles. If you put them place to drink, they would come. It's a party and they will eat the pests. So it's a good deal for everyone. So Yuval putting bad detectors, listening who's around, here they are, then checking the pests on the trees. Other pests, of course they are. This is the, the date moss. And he puts eight pools in the plantation, put water, take them out, and along the season, which is spring, uh, summer, four nights he's examining which bats are, are active before he puts the water, four nights, during the water is there and after the water is drained. And his results are overwhelming. During the water, during the time when there is water in the pools, the abundancy uh, and uh, higher activity, higher species richness uh, than before uh, or after. And uh, the way to help them is put uh, some roosting uh, places. Now there is a researcher from Palestine, which from the Arava Institute, which is actually, he's a, an engineer and his job is to make the bat roosting uh, boxes. This is a, a better and a better uh, adapt, adjusted to our climate. Why do the, the bats need these boxes anyway? They, they roost in caves far away from the plantation and fly sometimes tens of kilometers for their foraging area. But what if they had a small cave at the plantation, then life will be e easier for them. More of them would arrive and they would spend more time foraging. So this is the logic uh, of putting these uh, boxes in the plantations. So who should take care of all this mess? Who should take care of the stop oversight? Is it the nature conservationist, the researcher, the state? Well, it's probably the farmer because he has the interest. And this is this uh, research goal was to show the farmers that inviting the birds into, your, into their fields is the right thing to do for them, not just to make the fields better stop oversight, better and safer, but mainly for their own benefit. For they can use uh, the pest control services the birds and the bats provide. And I think uh, we are open to questions. Out of time. We are out of time. Yes. Sorry to say, Noam, this has been fascinating. Uh, thank you very much. Stopping the screen share. Thank you so much, Noam and Jessica. What a fantastic uh, research project. Uh, great cooperation between you researchers down there in the Arabat. So uh, thank you. Really, yeah. Uh, it's not just it's not just us. There are many people involved. There are specialists involved. Kami Corin is a professor from the Ben Gurion University. Is a uh, an expert on bats, so uh, we are always trying to work with all the experts. 
That's cool. Yeah, there's a lot of subspecialties involved, I can see. And a lot of stakeholders, as you just showed us in the last slide. But uh, but parties at your house sound fantastic. Uh, a pool and, and music and uh, lots of birds. So um, I have lots of questions myself, but there are questions piling up. So we'll get right to them. And truth is, we only have 10 minutes officially on the clock. So let's do uh, very brief answers. Um, First, though, uh, with Lenny Ganes, who is, um, Dan and I met him in New Mexico. He's, uh, uh, I think he directs the science faculty at a community college in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he did his PhD, if I'm not mistaken, in a lot. I don't know, Noam, if you remember. Uh, I think Dan might have asked you about him once. Anyway, um, he's asking a question, which I, and other people have asked questions, I think, during the, uh, during the presentation you sort of related to. But have you had any luck working with the farmers to time application of pesticides to reduce impact on migratory species? What? So we have, uh, it's uh, like not about the migratory species, but we have uh, the farmers look into the pests uh, first. So um, basically there is an IPM protocol in place um, for like where the farmers um, get samples, uh, send them to the lab in the mock, um, we investigate how many pests they actually have, and according to the rates of pests, uh, pesticides are used. So they're not just used wildly, but they're used uh, whenever they're really needed. And I just talked to the one of the organic farmers today, actually, the Samar plantation we talked about, and they just told us today that last year they didn't have to spray in one of the in one part of their plantation at all because they were relying totally on biological pest control. They didn't have to spray any pesticides at all. So they do give it a chance. They do give it a try. Actually, the the, the lecture I gave a few months ago was about, about the crazy spring we had, crazy spring migration, and we showed that this spring we had enormous numbers of uh, birds that passed through our region in May. And that explains the, the, the need, the possibility of not spraying at all this year in the day plantations, yeah. Interesting, thank you. Um, Sandra wants to know, does ground vegetation in date plantations use up too much extra water? Well, it, it does. Uh, actually, the question of water is, uh, is very interesting in the growing uh, dates in the Arava because uh, the, most people think that uh, most people uh, understand now that uh, they are over watered anyway. Uh, actually, the farmers uh, fight the vegetation most of the time. They bring donkeys, they use herbicides. So I, I, this, the, none of the, plus, uh, of the plantations uh, thought to create this habitat. It just grows because uh, of the very intensive uh, uh, watering of the dates. So I don't think it will take extra water. It will actually take less work from the farmer because at the moment they spend a lot of F uh, resources in cutting this vegetation rather than letting it stay. Now this vegetation does use some water, but I don't think there is a, you can see the results in the crops, the yield. I don't think there is a real. Uh, so there's like, there's a disagreement. Some farmers say it does use water. Some farmers say it, it, it's not so bad. So. It's, it's, uh, so yes, of course, it's a, it's a plant there, so the plant uses uh, some water, but it depends also on how, what kind of growth you have under the, uh, under the palm trees um, and how much water it uses. Cool, thanks. Um, Fred Carroll has a question, and I'm gonna add my similar question that I was wondering as well. He asks, has similar research been done elsewhere in the world uh, regarding birds and pest control, specifically in migratory areas? And I, I wanted to ask uh, the corollary question, which is, is the, is the work you did have done here, the research you've done here applicable, A, to other habitats, and B, to similar types of habitats in the same, uh, you know, around the same belts around the world? Either For of those sure. things? For sure. So, so the first researchers that worked actually on this topic worked in the tropics, in the Indonesia, it was Beamas on cacao, then followed the research in Costa Rica about coffee. It was just in the tropics and uh, we got inspired. Bea was here in 2019 and she's, she actually learned with Jessica in Germany in the university. And uh, we thought, why, wh why not here in the super arid uh, uh, place? Now here in the desert, 
it's easy to research it because there are no distractions for the birds. They come to the field. But the methods that are useful here would be useful anywhere. Uh, birds are giving pest control everywhere. We are just looking here in our area how to make it uh, work better. That's all. So basically what you can do is you can fine tune it, like you can use what already has been done and the knowledge that's already there, which the same with what we are doing. We know that specific things we look in, uh, we should look into like water or shelter and so on that have, has been found good in other places and then like copy it to your place and see what species you have there, what are the, mi what are the migration routes exactly if you're talking about migration and so on. And then like uh, do, the, do the part that, hasn't been done in your area. Like, well, you know, I mean, one of the uh, conclusions I would draw is that the, the residents of the Aravar are very lucky that they have such an incredible bird research center right there that can do in their micro habitat exactly what needs to be done for the farmers. So chapeau. So yeah, it's, of course, you need, a, you need the, the right people working and you need to have some ornithologists uh, that, that can work uh, on it. If you don't have them at the space, you have to bring them. Uh, we are lucky that we have the, the, the birth center here and we can work yeah. with them. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's, uh, and this I think came up a couple of times, what's the difference in crop yield uh, when you use pesticides comparing to, compared to birds? Any, have you so we don't know that for our crop yet. We didn't. Uh, we, it's, that's one of the things uh, that we has to be checked in the long term. That would be uh, with exclusion experiments, uh, for example, to see what's the real impact of the birds and of the bats. Um, that's what what has been done in cacao, like the Norm showed the slide, where they found um, something about thirty percent, thirty one percent of a crop that was lost if the birds and bats did not have uh, access. Um, but of course, then you have to put another step to it if you want to also test the pesticides, pesticides versus biological pest control. Interesting. Um, and I'll ask, a, I'll jump ahead, uh, Avi, to the last question because it relates. Uh, have you checked or is it planning to check or is it obvious to farmers the dollar savings in using uh, birds as opposed to um, non-biological pesticides, non-natural pesticides? So in the in the case of barn owls, it was very clear. Uh, one of the scientific works done on the barn owls was showing this the economical benefit, and yes, the farmers see that it's beneficial. And this is why we have thousands and thousands of nest boxes for barn owls in the field. This is research that was done 10, 15 years ago. We are doing something innovative, something new, nobody, nobody ever did. Uh, uh, in this kind of crops, in this kind of environment. And I think this is yet to come. This is still early to say. Uh, what, what is nice to see that when you take the farmer with you monitoring, this is what we do. We, we usually call the farmer, please join us and watch the birds. So at, at least the awareness is growing. Yeah. They see that the birds are there and they work. He usually doesn't notice birds. The, the farmers don't notice the birds. But now suddenly you show them, why, what do the swallows do here? They eat, what do they eat? I ask him, what do they eat? He said, I know what they eat, they eat a white fly. They are flying here. I need to get rid of them, that's true. And I show them the birds crawling under the crop. They eat insects there. So when they see it, I think it's even more important than, you know, when you, you're a farmer, you don't always know what bro brought you the profit. Was it the bird? Was it the pesticide? Was it luck? What is the good quality of water or bad quality of water? It's, it's too complicated. They just see the final line. But when you show that the, the birds are one, at least one part, important part of the consideration of the result, then realize it's important. Amazing. We go a step further because in the in the days the farmers asked us for help with biopest control because um, the pesticides they have there are getting less and less uh, efficient. Um, you always have this problem when you will work with pests and chemicals, they get resi uh, resistant uh, to the pesticide. So uh, with, with biopest control, you often don't have that problems because the bird will eat the insect. There's not much for the insect to get resistant. Okay, two quick questions. This first one is a quick yes or no, or if you know. Are um, desert farmers in Egypt and Jordan and maybe the Palestinian territories working on these issues or beginning to look into this? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not yet, but we do have some cooperation. 
Okay. Yes, we work with Palestinians and in the burnouts for sure, yes. They right. were part the burnout, of the I was going to say, the burnout, yeah. we, we know that Yossi Leshem has started a project which works in many countries, several countries around the Middle East. Um, uh, Robin, uh, our friend and uh, director of, uh, in New, uh, New York asks, and I see there's another similar question about migrating birds and, and the timeline. Like what happens in between the migrations when there, when there are a few migrating birds? And the corollary question I saw in the chat is, can farmers time crops to be, uh, to, to, to be most efficient in terms of when the birds are migrating? So actually it happens naturally because the, 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 the pests in the fields, in the open fields, the, these are autumn, autumn season crops. So they, they coincide exactly with the movement of birds. Uh, this is, it makes sense because in summer, the, the sun is too strong. In winter, the, the day is too short. So the crops are either spring or autumn and also the pests are active in these seasons. And this is, uh, it's nature here. You know, when, when there is lots of food, migration comes. When food is scarce, there is also no migration. It works perfectly. So the answer is, it is correlated together. I have one right. last thing I wanna say, Jay, before we say goodbye here. Sure. Uh, for the nature conservationists of us. This is modern nature conservation. Uh, in the past, nature conservation was declaring reserves, keeping uh, open spaces as, as uh, very protected areas, and it is still very important to do it. But the birds choose with their wings to come to man manufactured habitats, to gardens, to fields, to orchards, and if we want to protect these birds, this flyway, this migratory birds flyway, the way goes through collaboration, through work, sometimes through research, which is not my natural area. I'm not a researcher most of the time. I'm a nature conservationist, but this is what nature conservation in the 21st century is all about. We have to be innovative. We have to think bigger. We have to work with the farmers and not against them. And if you bring a solution to the farmer, the birds would benefit. Thank you so much for that summing up, Noam. It was really perfect. What you're saying is start up nature and start up nation. Figure out how to get all the shareholders together, cooperate on the ground and in the air. And uh, we can do amazing things for the environment, for nature conservation, for biodiversity. I appreciate it very much. And, you mentioned all the ways that people in Israel need to get together to do that. The conservationists and the farmers, uh, they can be friends. And, um, and of course, everybody, everybody watching this webinar tonight can uh, help support your work and Jessica's work and our work in general, protecting the migratory fly route uh, from north to south and protecting all of Israel's biodiversity on land and in the sea, in the air, um, by supporting Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel our local affiliates in the US and in Canada, uh, tax exempt uh, nonprofits in both those places. Donation buttons are uh, on the emails uh, that we always send out uh, and they'll take you to a website where you can choose your currency and get a tax exempt donation. Appreciate that very, very much. Uh, there's a lot of work left to be done. Uh, Noam and Jessica, I think we'll have you back in another six months or so uh, to report on new findings or uh, new interesting aspects of your work down there in the Arava. And the other way you can support us, and you must in any way support your own enrichment by coming to visit uh, Israel in general. Skies are open um, officially as of uh, tomorrow, I guess. And uh, the migratory season is here. We'll be running a, a, a mission to Israel in November, the peak of the fall migration season. Uh, but getting to a lot and to our sites up north as well and in the center of the country, it's a must-see, our urban nature site. So please come visit, be in touch with us before you come. We'll hook you up with some amazing nature. And I'm sure Noam and Jessica will as well. I know I'm looking forward to getting down to a lot as soon as possible because you really uh, whet my appetite with all the seat, with all with everything you showed. And by the way, those illustrations are beautiful. The presentation was beautiful with all those birds species that you carefully somehow cut out and put in the right level of of of, of altitude. So Thank you very you much. You have to come and see them in the field and reel. I really do. I really do. I'm one of those guys. I, I, I don't notice the birds until I go out with the bird. I'm like, wow. Yeah. So thank everybody very much. We're over time. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for participating and for letting us know where you're from. 
people from all over the world. We got lots of great comments in the chats. I hope Jessica and uh, and Norm you had a chance to see these. And um, thank you very much, Avi in Toronto for the back office. And uh, Noam, Jessica, appreciate it very much. Signing off from uh, from Tel Aviv in the Arava in Toronto. Uh, see you in two weeks time. Amir Balaban is gonna be talking to us about uh, urban nature, about uh, the trees and how the forests are doing after the Jerusalem fires. Lots to talk about in two weeks with Amir Balaban. So see, here, see you here, same time, same place. Signing off. Good luck to the world. Bye. Bye-bye.